안녕하세요. 코트라 문바이 무역관 송지원입니다. 오늘 코트라 인도 식품시장 진출 설명회를 참석해 주셔서 대단히 감사합니다. 이번 설명회는 코트라 서남아 지역 본부와 문바이 무역관이 우리 식품 기업의 인도 시장 진출에 필요한 정보를 제공해 드리기 위해 마련된 행사로 다음과 같은 순서로 진행하겠습니다. 먼저 코트라 서남아 지역 본부 빈준화 본부장님의 말씀이 있겠습니다. 다음 인도 식품 규정 파서이에 관해 NKG 어드바이서리 비즈니스 리스터 서친 아친탈발님의 발표가 있겠습니다. 그 다음 인도 식품 수출 절차와 필요한 서류에 대해 인도의 유력한 식품 수입 밴더인 알반 플래터사 리스터 캄데시 솔랑키 씨가 발표해 주시겠습니다. 네 번째로 인도 식품 시장과 유통 구조에 대해 인도 1위 유통 기업인 릴라이언스 리테일사의 리스터 아비나 스트리퍼트님께서 발표해 주시겠습니다. 마지막으로 최근 인도 경제 동향과 코트라 식품 수출 지원 사업에 대해 문바이 무역과 민유지 차성님이 발표해 주시겠습니다. 그럼 바로 시작하겠습니다. 코트라 서남아 지역 본부의 빈준화 본부장님 인사 말씀 부탁드리겠습니다. 안녕하십니까. 코트라 서남아 지역 본부장 빈준화입니다. 먼저 인도 시장에 관심을 가져주시고 귀한 시간 내 오늘 식품 수출 설명회에 참석해 주신 우리 기업 여러분께 깊은 감사의 말씀 드립니다. 14억 인구를 보유한 인도의 식품 시장은 총 8,580억 달러 규모로 중국과 미국에 이어 세계에서 세 번째로 큰 시장이며 성장률도 세계 평균이 4.8%를 크게 웃도는 8.2%를 기록하고 있습니다. 우리 기업의 수출이 유망한 라면, 음료 등의 가공식품 분야는 현재 수익 규모가 137억 달러로 크지 않지만 성장세가 빠르고 유망한 분야이기 때문에 향후 5년에서 10년 이내에 연 700억 달러 규모로 커질 것으로 예상됩니다. 최근 인도에서 확산되고 있는 한류도 우리 식품 수출에 큰 힘이 되고 있습니다. 2020년에 코로나로 인한 인도 전역의 락다운은 역설적으로 한국 문화와 식품에 대한 관심이 급속히 증가하는 계기가 되었습니다. 2020년에 인도 넷플릭스의 K-컨텐츠 시청률은 전년 대비 4.7배 증가했고 한국산 라면 수입은 2.6배 늘었습니다. 또한 코로나 이후 인도 전통 소매점 비중이 감소하고 아마존, 필리카트 같은 온라인 플랫폼을 통해 구매하는 소비 패턴이 크게 확대되는 추세이며 이는 가공식품을 주력으로 하는 우리 식품기업에게 기회로 작용할 것으로 예상됩니다. 그러나 이 같은 한국 식품에 대한 높은 관심에도 불구하고 절대적인 수출 규모는 아직 낮은 수준에 머무르고 있습니다. 인도의 가공식품 수입 중 한국산 수입은 1,100만 달러로 그 비중이 0.1%에도 미치지 못하는 수준입니다. 아직 우리가 인도의 시장 잠재력을 충분히 활용하지 못하고 있다고 볼수 있습니다. 하지만 그만큼 진출 잠재력이 크다고도 할수 있겠습니다. 한국과 인도는 쌀과 면을 주식으로 하고 음식의 다양한 양념과 조미료를 사용한다는 점에서 공통점이 많습니다. 그래서 인도인들은 한국의 라면, 음료뿐 아니라 김치, 된장, 고추장 등도 거부감 없이 받아들이는 경우가 많습니다. 세계적인 시장조사기관 유로모니터도 인도 한식당의 고객이 70%가 현지인이라는 조사 결과를 발표하며 한국 식품의 인도 진출에 주목하였습니다. 물론 저가를 선호하는 인도 특성과 불투명한 행정 절차 등을 감안한다면 한국 식품의 인도 시장 진출도 쉽지만은 않을 것입니다. 최근 몇년 사이 오리온, 롯데제과 등 현지 투자 진출을 통해 초코파이, 제과, 아이스크림 등을 생산하고 있습니다. 인도 정부에서는 메이크인 인디아와 생산 연계 인센티브 제도를 통해 가공식품 산업을 인도 최우선 성장 지원 분야 중 하나로 선정한 바 있습니다. 인도는 해외 시장 진출 확대를 목표로 하는 우리 기업이라면 충분히 도전할 만한 가치와 잠재력을 가지고 있다고 말씀드릴 수 있겠습니다. 저희 코트라가 여러분의 성공적인 인도 시장 진출을 위해 열심히 노력하겠습니다. 마지막으로 인도 시장에 관심 가져주셔서 감사하다는 말씀을 다시 한번 드리고 이번 설명회와 상담회에서 좋은 성과 있으시기를 기원합니다. 감사합니다. 
감사합니다, 본부장님. 다음은 NQAG 미스터 나브라 빌미라 대표님과 미스터 사친 아친 달바님 발표를 듣겠습니다. Good day, everybody from India. I hope you, your, your families, your friends, everybody is nice, healthy. This is Bindra from uh, a company called NKG. We are based in New Delhi. I am uh, delighted to start this session, which is focused on uh, understanding the regulatory landscape for food and nutraceuticals or packaged foods. At the outset, I would like my, to extend my deep uh, uh, thanks to the entire Kotra team uh, spread across India and in South Korea. Who have had the good fortune of working since the last uh, seven to eight years uh, for giving us the opportunity to present this session to uh, the lovely members that have gathered here. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I run a company called NKG. Uh, my my name is Navraj Bindra, and uh, our company in India, we we are completely focused on providing regulatory solutions across uh, various categories of products uh, which are going to be placed on the Indian market. These products uh, 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 include uh, beauty and wellness products, cosmetic products, food and nutraceuticals, electronics, medical devices, drugs, vaccines, toys, and so on. We are working uh, uh, very closely with with uh, various embassies, commissions, and business uh, uh, conclaves uh, from around the world, uh, which which include Kotra, the U.S. consulate, and, and and many others from around the world. I would like to. Uh, introduce uh, the subject matter expert uh, with regards to FSSAI li uh, licensing and understanding the regulatory landscape of uh, the FSSAI rules in India, Mr. Sachin, to take forward this uh, discussion. Thanks, Noraj, for setting the context and uh, thanks to Kotra team for giving us an opportunity to share our views and share our inputs regarding the dynamics in the food regulatory landscape in India uh, in terms of the food. So the, the principal authority governing food in India is the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, which is under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India. And it has been introduced. Uh, uh, so the, basically the authority has been established in 2008, in the year 2008. And the act governing the food product across the, across the country, including the imported product, is the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. So basically, uh, as I said, why FSSCI has been established. So FSSCI is a Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. It is a statutory body under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It is an autonomous body, has been established under the Food Safety and Standards Acts of 2006, which I already mentioned. So what, what is the function of FSSCI is, is basically to lay, laying down the standards, science-based standards for articles of food and regulating the manufacture, storage, distribution, sell, and import. So that's why we are highlighted here import because import is a key component of the entire value chain of the food to ensure the safe and wholesome food for human consumption. And as we have mentioned, the, the principal regulation governing the import of food products in India is the Food Safety and Standards Import Regulations of 2017. So this has been framed after multiple consultation with respective stakeholders, including the changes in the global uh, regulatory framework. So it is in sync with the global requirements. So basically what it says, we already explained in the previous slide. So these regulations, which basically lay down the procedure for clearance of food products imported into India, and it includes various provisions relating to the licensing of food importer who is importing the goods into country, clearance of food by the food authority, like how the food import clearance will happen. Then if you are importing for specific purpose, like research and development purpose, or for, uh, let's say, uh, for any trade exhibition purpose or for personal consumption, so all those conditions are being defined in the regulation. Then the, what kind of storage mechanism has to be there, inspection and sampling of imported food, how the inspection and sampling of imported food will be carried out. Then the laboratory analysis of uh, how the laboratory analysis will be carried out and what kind of prohibition and restrictions are being already notified in the regulation that is also will be covered. And also, also the labeling provision, which is very bone of contention, but always between the international trade, so a lot of uh, requirements has been uh, streamlined and it is in sync with the global requirements and it keeps getting amended as and when required depending on the representation of the industry and depending on the regulatory dynamics in other parts of the globe. And also, if you are, if you are facing any concerns, if your shipment is rejected, 
So you still have a provision to file the appeal, which is called as a review mechanism. You can always file the appeal and it is also two tier level appeal. Even if the first appeal gets rejected, you still go ahead and reach to the for the second appeal with the C chief executive officer of FSSAI. And depending on the merit of the case, the decision will be granted. And based on that, if the decision is favorable, the shipments will get cleared uh, from the respective port. And one of the major steps which is taken by FSSAI, which we have explained, is the risk-based sampling of imported food article, which facilitate ease of doing business while also not compromising health of the public. So as, as we mentioned, so this is basically depending on the trade analysis and the, and the, and the profile of the importer. If let's say the same product is imported uh, in last uh, four or five shipments are without any issues, then the, the next shipment will get automatically cleared by doing only basic checks. It may not be sent for the sampling to the respective lab. So this will save a lot of time and cost for the importer who is importing the goods into, in, into India. So basically it covers all type of food products. So now let's begin with the overview of the food safety and standard import regulations of 2017. So this is something we have already explained, like which are all the stakeholders or the businesses which will cover as a part of the entire food supply chain. So import is an integral part, which we have already explained. And just to reiterate, import is basically under the central licensing of FSSAI, and you have to apply for the licenses on the FOSCOS portal, which we have seen before. So now uh, we'll just quickly uh, run you through how the import process works here. So whenever the shipment is landed, first you have to file the uh, application with the ICE gate, which is the system of the customs, uh, Indian customs, that typically how it is uh, there in other countries as well. Then you have to file the bill of entry. Then after that, depending on the duty structure, you have to pay the duty. Then after paying the duty, the customs will direct the application to relevant authorities, including FSSAI, so the portal for import is basically the FICS, Food Import Clearances System. Then after uploading all the details in the Food Import Clearance System, then it will be uh, submitted to the FSSA. This is completely online. Then it is it will be scrutiny done by the Food Safety and Standard Authority of Officer. The officers are called as authorized officer. And if there is any query, then it will be posted on the F F through FICS. Then if once, uh, once that query is come, you will also get an alert and you can also check it online. Then you can resolve queries by submitting the necessary documents. And after that, they will do the, then you have to do the payment for a fee for inspection and sampling. And after that, they will do the visual inspection of the container, product labels and all. And if, if there is any issue in terms of the labeling, uh, not in, in not as per the FSCI labeling requirements. So then they will also give an opportunity to rectify the label. And then there are uh, various rectifiable labeling uh, provisions are there, which you can always rectify even after importing the goods into country. And after doing those changes, the reinspection will be ha will happen at respective port. And after once the officers, the respective authorities are satisfied, then uh, uh, then only the sampling uh, will be done for the respective product. And the sampling uh, after doing the sampling, it will be sent to the respective lab, which is approved by the FSCAI. And the FICS, which is the food import clearance system, that will, system will only decide which lab it has to be sent. Accordingly, the sample will be sent to the respective lab. And if it, if the product complies with all the requirement as per FSCI, which is defined for that particular product category, the no objection certificate will be generated online on the system. And once the NOC is generated automatically, then it will be sent to the respective customs officer at that port uh, through the completely online process. And finally, after, after get, uh, reviewing the NOC issued by FSSAI, customs will clear the goods uh, at respective port. And if the product is not meeting the criteria, then the non-conformance report will get generated. And again, you, have, you will get an opportunity for resampling and retesting, but only once. And after that also, if the sample is failed, then the shipment will get rejected and then it will be uh, sent for the review. So the appeal process is there, which we'll see as we move along. So, so just to quickly brief about like what we have just explained, the difference between the no objection certificate and non-conformance report. No, no, no objection certificate is basically issued to the importer after, after complying with all the requirements, including the testing. And if it is not complying, then the non-conformance report will be, will be issued and then the shipment will get rejected. Then packing list and stuffing list is something, this is the custom requirement where you need to submit all the details in the prescribed format by Indian customs, including the stuffing list. Then unclaimed articles and uncleared articles. So if, if the importer has imported the goods, but he has not willfully 
uh, actually uh, submitted the details for clearance then then the goods will remain at the port and then uh, it won't be cleared so but after, after certain time frame the authority is having uh, basically uh, the the rights to uh, dispose the goods as per the due procedure so let's look at the quickly look at the import uh, definition so this is something we have already explained uh, so in the interest of time uh, we'll we'll skip uh, and we'll move forward so uh, authorized officer is something who is the nodal nodal officer who is responsible for ensuring the smooth import clearance uh, for the imported goods in the country and there are many other other definitions important definition which is given uh, which is mentioned uh, you will see on the screen there is best sampling we have already explained and there you know see we have explained ncr we have explained and one of the important thing uh, for importing food products in india that the balance shelf life so you need to ensure that the balance shelf life of the product after landing the goods in the country should be minimum 60% balance shelf life from the date of manufacturing not from the date of import so let's look at the licensing of food importer as we have mentioned that all importers shall have the import license issued by the central licensing authority and also it needs to have a valid shelf life of not less than 60% or 3 months before expiry which we have just explained and the prerequisite for obtaining the fsci import license is the iec code which is called as the import export code issued by the directorate general of foreign trade under the ministry of commerce so before applying for the fsci import license you need to obtain the iec from the dgft which uh, our team will also help you in supporting uh, uh, in, in obtaining the same before we file the license for the F, uh, uh, under the import category with fssai so uh, in what case the suspension or cancellation of license will happen so basically if let's say if your iec is cancelled by the authority by virtue of any non compliance or duty structure or any other issues in such case if your iec is basically uh, cancelled then automatically your fssai license will be cancelled then first you have to first update your iec get the iec reactivated by dgft and then only your licensing uh, the fssi license will get reactivated and if there is any food safety issues and if there is any harm to the consumer because of import of any unsafe food from the respective geography like korea and if there is a belief that that importer has imported as unsafe food then in such cases also the license will be basically cancelled by the authority or suspended by the authority and then uh, as we have just ex explained then then they will also look at the all the other uh, submissions after uh, if there is any willful default or if there is any default then you can always submit all the necessary corrections or actions you have taken and again you can get your iec first reissued uh, within uh, within 7 days then uh, then you will get your again the fssi license will be granted and reactivated with the same license number now look at look at the various aspects of uh, what kind of clearance of the imported food and what kind of activities are covered so here uh, here is the case so basically this is something we have already explained in the in, in the overall process overview of the imported food products till it uh, cleared by the customs uh, basically including the noc and the ncr and all so this due process will be followed by the respective uh, authorized officer at fssai for the importer and just to reiterate the system for filing all the documentation reviewing the documentation checking the status for imported products is the food import clearance system of fssai like for licensing the system is called as foscos food safety compliance system for import the, there is a separate portal called food import clearance system so uh, so this is all this is something we have already uh, discussed in the form of flow flow, uh, flow process in the previous slides and finally once the basically the inspection is done it the the inspection report will be submitted in form 1 so look at uh, look at the kind of uh, the labeling requirements are being uh, introduced in india and what kind of uh, basically uh, rectifiable defects which you can actually do it even after importing the goods into country and if if you have missed something which are being rectifiable in nature you can always do the stickering after landing the goods in india by taking the due permission after doing the stickering then the again the goods will be subjected for clearance so there are uh, there are five key things which you can always rectify one is the name and address of the importer if you are not put if you have missed to put the details of the importer then the fssci logo and license number of the importer veg and non veg logo because this is very specific to india if the product is of vegetarian ori origin you have to put the veg logo which is in green color circle inside and the square outside and the non veg now it has been changed it is in triangle inside and the circle outside 
then the category or subcategory number with a generic name uh, and composition for the proprietary food for which there are no defined standards and any other labeling information which can be rectifiable which will be notified by authority from time to time so as so this so what how when can be rectified labeling deficiency done so basically the authorized officer of respective port will pass an order during scrutiny or after visual inspection to carry out the rectifiable labeling deficiency as permissible without masking or altering the original information so whatever the additional details or if you are trying to put it in the form of a single non detachable sticker you should not cover the other mandatory declaration on the label and after doing all the process or to doing all the due process then they will conduct the inspection or reinspection before drawing the sample and after that only after they are satisfying in terms of your labeling then only the samples will be subjected for the testing and if 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 you fail to rectify within the particular time let's say if the officer gives you within within a week you have to you have to clear then also uh, th then you have to you have to comply with the order and if if you don't follow that order then your shipment will get rejected and accordingly the subsequent sampling will be done and once after obtaining the report from the lab if it is complying with all the requirements then the authorized officer can issue the no objection certificate in case uh, accordingly and fi finally you can uh, then the goods will be cleared by the customs so let us look at the additional rectifiable labeling requirements uh, which uh, in addition to the labeling requirements which are rectifiable in nature after importing the goods into country what we have seen in the previous slide so even if uh, you you miss to write the name and address of the manufacturer or packer it can be verified by the documents submitted along with uh, the certificate of analysis or any other documents given by the importer then if the lot batch number or lot or the batch number or the code number is missing then also this can be verified from the documents and accordingly they will give the permission for necessary labeling and also the date of manufacture or packing and if 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 the declaration regarding food additives like if you are adding any preservative or any acid acidity regulator or any other any other additive for the basically which is duly approved by fssai but if it the labeling is not as per fssai still you can go ahead and do the labeling by taking the due permission from the respective authorized officer at respective port so let us look at what kind of mandatory declaration has to be there for imported food items which will be brought to india which is meant for retail sale directly to the customers so the product should contain name of the product name and address of the manufacturer or packer if 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 it is packed at different location if, and if it is manufactured at different location then you have to give the details of both but if it is only manufactured then you have to give the details of the manufacturer its name and address basically the legal address then the country of origin let's say the product is imported from south korea or north korea or uk or us you have to mention country of origin united kingdom or country of origin usa or country of origin canada which has to be there on the label then name and address of the importer fssa logo and license number of the importer wage non wage logo date of manufacture lot code so we have given this as a highlighted because this is something you can always basically do the necessary correction but it it's basically involves a lot of documentation scrutiny and the time frame so basically we always advise our uh, clients to ensure that all these declarations are in place before shipping the goods from the ex overseas country so that you can save on the demerage or detention cost after landing the goods into into india and the demerage and detention cost varies from port to port if the port is government uh, government operated port then obviously the cost will slightly lower and if the if the if the port is operated by private operator then the demerage detention cost per day will be very high so hence we always uh, uh, ask our clients to ensure that all these declarations are in place before shipping the goods into india and then another things which is basically which we have highlighted are allowed as rectifiable deficiencies which we have already seen in the previous slide so then this is risk based food import clearance so this is something we have already briefed so what uh, what it says is basically let's say if you are uh, you have imported four shipments of biscuits and if there are no issues being raised by the authority and if if it, if there was a food uh, completely smooth clearance then the subsequent shipment depending on the trend analysis of the importer and the profiling of the importer subsequently the officer will only look at the authorized officer will only look at the product labels and the basic compliance they will not send the sample for testing and so that you can get uh, significant significant cost saving in terms of demerit detention as well as because 
the entire test report after drawing the sample will take between 7 to 10 working days uh, for getting the reports so uh, depending on the uh, basically the demerit detention structure the the, the demerit detention cost will vary so here is the advantage of risk based food import clearance so this is called as a green channel in the fssai terminology so with this uh, we will uh, conclude here we extend our uh, our friendship and uh, our our togetherness with uh, with the entire portra team we will be more than happy uh, to help uh, any any south korean companies coming into india i, I wish uh, uh, all of you uh, a healthy happy and, and and super successful 2022 and i look forward to hearing from you during this session and even after this my contact details are mentioned in this session and uh, you can contact us uh, at a very simple email addresses which is contact at npgabc.com it is mentioned on this slide and uh, you can either reach out to Kotra team and they can direct you to us uh, for all your questions we will be more than happy to welcome you to india god bless you please stay safe and uh, stay fit <laughs>그 동안 한국 식품 수입 경험을 바탕으로 우리 기업에 꼭 알아야 할 인도 수출 절차와 서류들에 대해 말씀해 주시겠습니다. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kamlesh from a company called Urban Platter. Uh, we are India's one of the largest corner food ingredients uh, company. Uh, we primarily retail uh, on e-commerce platform like Amazon India and our own website. And uh, we also do ha have our chain of stores where we basically uh, import food ingredients from all across the world and uh, try to make it available for the Indian consumer. A product like uh, uh, gochujang, which is a very native to uh, Korea, you can find with us, or for, you can you can find a maple syrup, which which is uh, originating from Canada. A pure maple syrup you can find with us. A lot of other ingredients uh, uh, is something that we import uh, on a regular basis. And uh, I, along with one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Nehiji, we take care of the imports for the company. And uh, this, this is about us. Uh, we started back in 2015 uh, as a company with a very simple mission that uh, try to get as much as ingredients, food products from across the world. Uh, wherein uh, one can try and enjoy and by cooking those recipes uh, sitting at home and uh, he can he can uh, cherish those ingredients by having them at, and consuming them at home. Uh, I, I would primarily walk you through, uh, through the process how to import uh, food items or to export food items to the Indian market. Uh, Indian market is the one of the largest food importing company a lot of food ingredients consumables uh, are imported on a regular basis and in huge volumes uh, if, like like any regular uh, export for you and import for us the basic documentations that are needed uh, to export food items to india are the invoice Packaging list, please note that the invoice should always be in English uh, because uh, uh, any other native non-language shall not be accepted by the customs or the officials or the authorities here in India. Uh, they are very clear that if you are importing anywhere from the world, try to get the documentations in English as possible. So one of them is the invoice. The invoice should clearly mention the exporter's name, should mention the importer's name, the product name, whatever, what are you exporting to, uh, or what are you uh, shipping to the country, uh, the price and in, in which currency, uh, I mean, US dollars or euro or whatever uh, currency you deal into, it should be clearly mentioned over there. The number of units should be mentioned over there. These are the basic necessities which are mandatory to be mentioned in the invoice. Uh, coming next to uh, is the packaging list. Uh, packaging list is nothing but a simple document 
which says that uh, X company is the exporter of the goods and there is another company who is the importer of the goods. Again, it has similar details which invoices also have, but it does not have the, uh, the prices. Uh, details like how many boxes are there, how many pallets are there, how many pallets, uh, how many in units in one carton are there, how many such cartons are on one pallet are there, what is the gross weight of the box of the pallet, what is the net weight of the uh, of the of the uh, product that you are shipping out? These are the basic necessary details which are incorporated in the packaging list, which basically helps a lot of uh, like like the shipping company uh, at the port who uh, while receiving the cargo they they don't have to look at any other document but the packaging list to find out what is and how much is this in the respect to cargo coming to the third very important document is the certificate of origin it is basically a document which has been issued by the chambers of commerce uh, uh, let me put this way that in india no i mean there I, when when i when i when i started with the imports for the company uh, i was not aware that the certificate of origin should be only from the chambers of commerce. A lot of vendors, they issue a certificate on the their letterhead stating that this product is of this origin, but it is not expected, accepted in India. The document should be stamped, sealed by the chambers of commerce and though that is the only document which is accepted as a valid certificate of origin to define the product's origin uh, and that is the only document that is accepted as certificate of origin. No letter heads or any other document or any other agency's document are accepted as certificate of origin in India. Uh, coming to the fourth document, as we are exporting your export, you will be exporting food items to India. Uh, India uh, has the Food Safety Authority of India, which is also called, also known as FS, FSSAI. It's the governing body which is responsible to ensure that whatever food is imported into India or manufactured in India is as per the guidelines, those are being issued by them or implemented by them. Any dog product, food item, which is not as per the guidelines, they strictly, strictly, strictly do not clear the cargo and they reject it, reject it. At times, we can go to FSSCI and request them an exemption, which is a rare cases, but on the majority of the time, the cargo is no other thing, but needs to be exported back to the origin where it came from because because of the reason, multiple reasons, like it, it, it could be not as per the standards of food which have been declared by the FSSAI. There could be a labeling problem, there could be a declaration problem. Uh, we will see what other problems can lead to the rejection of the cargo in the next slide, which I will walk you through. And some additional declarations. Uh, that, that's the fifth document. Uh, well, India and Korea have a mutual trade agreement that a certain food items or not just food items but a lot of other food and uh, non-food items which are traded between the countries they do carry a duty benefit now reason being the importer will request you or the exporters to 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 get a certificate of origin well here the certificate of origin plays a very critical role for the importer to get the duty benefit if that document, the certificate of origin, is not issued by the Chambers of Commerce, uh, uh, which is also that, uh, which is also uh, uh, the uh, chances of uh, getting no duty benefits are quite high. Uh, this scheme is called SEPA, which is Comprehensive Economic 
uh, agreement which helps uh, the importer to claim duty benefit with the customs department where the standard import duty here in India imports any food item is around 45-50% of the product's value. But if there is a certificate of origin which is issued by the SEPA, uh, by the Chambers of Commerce, that duty benefit is applied to the product. And the customs duty drastically drop downs anywhere between 10 to 12 percent of the product value. Now here, it is not only the importer who is benefited out of it. If the products import duty drops down gradually, the importer will definitely pass on that benefit to the consumer. Eventually, the product which was supposed to be sold at a higher price is now being sold at a slightly comparable and good price, which will lead that more consumption will happen. As more consumption will happen, the importer will buy it regularly and more frequently. So this is a great initiative taken by the, both the governments uh, wherein uh, the trade is, uh, is uh, cherished between uh, both the governments and uh, importers do take benefits of it. So that's about the certificate of origin and additional declarations are nothing but a supportive document or a declaration might be needed while you go for a duty benefit. It's not a specific, there are chances that at some times customs department do ask for the declaration, but most of the time it is, it gets clear. The more regularly the same product is being imported by the same importer and has been exported by the same exporter, the it, it goes under less scrutiny from the customs department because it's a regular activity that is happening and they will, they will not intervene into the activity unless and until they find it something that there is a problem into it and they, they, they want to try to find out. But it's a very strict business uh, that goes on. Uh, this is with respect to the, uh, uh, the documentations that are needed for exporting or importing food items to India. Uh, now we will move on to the next slide, which is with related to the labeling guidelines. Uh, for importing any food items to the India. So the product, when it is imported to India, uh, FSCI strongly believes that the packaging of the product should be so simple that the consumer, they do not get confused and they understand what this product is, what are its ingredients, what the, who is the manufacturer, if it is an imported product, who is the importer? Uh, nowadays, uh, people are living a healthy life and they are more cautious about what they eat, how much calories do they consume, how much sugar do they consume, how much fat or oil are they consuming. So nutritional panel uh, should declare this details and it should be so prominent that one could like easily uh, see it and understand it, where the product is coming from, uh, coming to the ingredients part, a lot of people are right now uh, in across the world are following a specific kind of diet. Um, it could be gluten free, it could be vegan, it could be uh, probably grains only. So ingredients do help the consumer to make a decision whether is it as per his requirement or it is not. So it helps them to take a decision. Product name is definitely the manufacturer's name. Though it is not very important for the consumer that who is the manufacturer of the product, but to assume, assume that uh, uh, a product has been imported or been manufactured, uh, but uh, there is a problem with the product. How can one identify where the problem is? Who has manufactured it? So that's one of the biggest uh, uh, way to find out that importer's name, manufacturer's name is there. As I said, nutritional panel is also mandatory and from which country is it imported? Why does that matter? I mean, a product is product. How, how does it matter that from which country it is imported? I would like to say that it does matter. In India, uh, I would like to put this example by us. Uh, we import the gochujang, which is made in Korea. 
now there are other options available in the market which are probably made for, which have been manufactured by some other com- uh, countries where probably mochujang is not the native food uh but but uh, i mean it is available at a very cheap price than mine but a consumer who wants to enjoy the authentic ingredient or the taste of that respective area would la- would be happy to see that my gochujang is been imported from korea but not other country uh, maple syrup i i put maple syrup from canada someone would be happy to i mean he would have more belief on the product that this product is coming from the respective origin where it is it is uh, uh, traditionally consumed so country of origin plays here a very important role and the three major thing which are also mandatory is the manufacturing date expiry date and batch number uh i have an i, I have an uh an example or an incident wherein i had imported uh, a product and uh, it just had the expiry date and nothing else on it so it was long back and we had a issue with the fsci and they were not ready to clear that product because it was not as per their guidelines i believe uh, because it was not mandatory to declare the manufacturing date or batch number in the country from where i had expo- i have imported it i was not aware back then but then when it came to india i came to know so whenever you are exporting to india please do uh, even if it is not mandatory in, in the local market to uh, it is okay to not disclose these details it is very much uh, mandatory to mention this details on the product whichever you are exporting to india the manufacturing date the day when it is manufactured expiry date the shelf life 12 months uh, 24 months 36 months and the batch number the batch number is to trace the product manufacturing activity back if there is an issue in that respect to batch number it's a manufacturing way it's a it's a trick of the manufacturers wherein they can sideline a specific batch of products if they found there is an issue so not all the products that are available in the market uh, of that respect to manufacturer gets affected but only a certain batch of products are sidelined so that it can be further deep dived and the problems can be find out so these are the basic details which are mandatory other than this uh, there are other small small things which are also mandatory like fsci number every importer or food manufacturer or the retail uh, stores whoever is dealing in food items in india they are governed by the fsci they are issued uh, a specific license number which is uh, which is related to them which has been mandatory to declare on the packaging material then it comes the green logo which is also uh, if it if the product is vegetarian it comes as a green logo uh, if the product is non vegetarian then it should have a red logo just to differentiate the product if it is a vegetarian product or a non vegetarian product so the the consumer can make a decision that uh, if the product is something which he wants to have can have or should not have if that is a product which uh, is a non vegetarian product uh, uh, there are certain examples which which basically is something like what packaging should not be exported to the indian market here is the next slide so here you can see that the packaging material uh, is the original packaging material of this product is in korean only a small sticker which has the fsci license number product details product name mrp this is not allowed this is the restrictive packaging to be imported to the india because as per the government they do not believe that all the details that are mentioned in the smaller packaging are correct they they think that there are chances that they the the details might be misleading and hence they, they they reject the packaging and they reject the cargo and they do not allow it to 
get been cleared and sold into the Indian market. I will take you back to the uh, slide we just saw, like which is the right packaging material that, that can be imported to India. You can see this brand of noodles, Jin Ramen, is the right packaging which needs to be imported to India, or can be imported to India, because you can see the, the details which I which have covered over here, uh, the ingredient list, the manufacturer name, the exporter name, FSCI license, nutritional panel, it's all in English. Country of origin, you can see that it's written made in Korea, it's all in English. This is the acceptable packaging that can be swiftly cleared in India to once it lands and has no issues to get clearance. Vis-a-vis, this packaging will definitely get stuck in the customs because nothing on this packaging is in English. It's all in Korea. So to avoid the problems when you export to India, please ensure that the packaging are customized. Uh, I, I mean, when we import to, uh, if we approach to the, uh, any of the exporter across the world, uh, we ask them to help us uh, get the product in private label. And uh, everyone asks us, why do you want to get a product in private label? Because it has its own set of MQs and packaging investment and all. So the reason is very simple. Uh, rather than importing such packaging to India, wherein we might be in a problem, the, the customization is, and, and this doesn't look good. I mean, to a consumer, it doesn't look good. A packaging should look good. So when we, uh, we, we, we try to explain to the exporter that any which ways of additional sticker like this, which will uh, not look good is needed to be added on the product's packaging to comply it with the food import laws. So might as well change the packaging, make it private label and make it compliant to us with the industry standard. And that's when the, uh, a lot of you, uh, down the line, when you start exporting, you will find a lot of uh, importers approaching you that customize the packaging. This is the reason because uh, there will be one or the another details which will be missed if the, if the same packaging is used and they will have a problem to clear the food item in India. And if they have a problem, chances are that they might not turn up, turn up for the second order or maybe continue the business because a lot of importers, they, they, get, they, 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 they get frustrated. So if anyone is approaching you to, to customize the packaging, please do help them with the customization of the packaging because that will help them to clear this product swiftly. More sales, more business to everyone. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, we we uh, we we uh, take this strategy uh, very uh, uh, use the strategy a lot of the time, wherein a product is very interesting and very new to the Indian market, uh, but uh, the the printing MOQ is is thousands of units at times. Like packaging customization is thousands of units of customers. Um, this is the last slide over here, which is the su suggested packaging material for small quantities. A lot of people will approach you uh, for, to begin with the business with the small quantities as they want to try it uh, for the Indian market. Uh, such labels, basic labels, which has the mandatory details like product name, ingredients, nutrition panel, FSOC and logo. And the basic, the, all the basic details we just covered up in the, in the slides back. Uh, uh, if this label, these details are also mentioned in the label, in such simple label, products do get cleared in the Indian market. So that is also an option for uh, importing and they can be repackaged or relabeled or, or, or uh, customized here back in India. So that um, it is not mandatory to meet the MOQs of packaging material when it has been uh, manufactured or pre-packed at the origin. Uh, this is all from my end. I thank you everyone for attending this session. So good evening all, uh, I am Avinash Tripathi, uh, I head the purchase in Reliance Retail. I would like to introduce you all to the retail and food industry of India. 
so let me take you to the presentation so today we'll cover uh, this point in our uh, call so I'll, I'll i'll brief you about the overall grocery retail in india uh, which are the organized uh, grocery retail player in india and i'll also uh, tell you about the specialty stores uh, which are available in india so the first question which comes in the mind like where does india buy its groceries so if you see the numbers so 89% purchase from the kiranas so the the count is 89% versus the 11% is uh, purchase uh, their kirana through the modern trade stores so you can see there is a huge potential in terms of the organized store in india uh, so in this slide you can see the organized retail is growing at twice the rate at which our organized retail is growing so if you see the graph the in financial year 2012 the organized retail contribution was 27 billion dollar in india versus in 2019 it it went up to 88 billion dollar and in 2025 it is expected to grow to 237 billion dollar which 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 will be contribute to 60 16% of the overall indian retail market so this this is due to the increased digital penetration during the covid has expect has expedited the growth of organized retail in india also uh, it also uh, the growth in uh, per capita income it improving the in infrastructure further adds to the growth of the organized retail in india so in in the current pandemic so retail will be the uh, theme in the new normal so where people are becoming more health conscious so there's a there's a demand of the health products also you can see there is a huge surge in the online sales and greater options of the online channel uh, also from browsing to sprinting people are in rush to leave stores after shopping is done also people prefer more of the contactless shopping and also they are adopting the digital payment uh, nowadays so the organized retail uh, comprises of the modern trade format and the ecom ecom platform and unorganized uh, comprised of the small scale over the counter and the kirana shops so in case of organized retail so modern retail consists of supermarkets specialty stores self checkout and convenience stores whereas the e-commerce con uh, consist of the e-tailers marketplace and the hyper local grocery retailers so this is just a bif bifurcation between the organized and the unorganized retail in india we will we'll discuss more about the organized retail in organized retail the grocery market share is uh, like 22% which is of uh, reliance retail and 16% of future retail so in reliance retail uh the sub companies which are there in, under reliance retail is reliance fresh reliance smart reliance signature fresh uh, and uh, shahkari bhandar and in case of future retail it is big bazaar food all easy day etc and the 62% contributes to the uh, other stores in india uh, the types of the retailers in india in, in terms of the organized uh, retail market the one are the physical stores the second are the e-commerce and third one is the digital so retail is nothing but it's the uh, combination of the physical and the retail stores in india so in this slide you can see how the stores are positioned in india like for the mars where the products are available on the discounted price for mastige there there is a superior customer experience and wide range of indian and international assortment in case of premium there are brand experiences superior customer experiences and premium exclusive products uh, which include indian and and international products and in case of luxury there is a retail and experiential and exclusive products available for for the end customers so in case of mars uh, these uh, the stores which comes are the reliance fresh reliance smart reliance smart point it's dmart big bazaar more and star bazaar in case of mastige uh, the stores covered are reliance fresh signature hyper city uh, spencer hypermarket and spar hypermarket and in case of premium there are fresh pick and food all so you can see there is a huge opportunity uh, in the premium and the luxury segment so oh, specialty segment is nothing but the premium segment which is largely untapped as there are only limited players in india so if you see uh, in case of reliance we have recently we have launched the uh, store in specialty segment the reliance fresh signature store so now i'll take you through the uh, different types of uh, different formats uh, available in india so one is the convenience store uh, which is available uh, like where the merchandise available is fruits vegetable dairy staples process food beverages and personal care products also this is available for bars at a discounted price the second format is the supermarket format which consists of the general merchandise apparel pet food fresh food staples and fmcg food the third type is the hypermarket format 
which consist of the uh, fish and poultry meat dairy apparel and uh, crockery items and the and the last one is the specialty format which provides the indian and international products along with the experience so in india the regional players available in this category in this format is the uh, modern bazaar qmart and the national uh, players available are the food mall uh, reliance fresh signature and the nature basket so we have recently launched the reliance fresh signature store uh, in 2019 uh, and with with an aim to be the grocery destination store in premium catchment uh, currently we are operating with two stores in india the sizes of this store is in between 4000 to 5000 square feet uh, the both the stores opened are in mumbai so what we give to the customer is it combines the convenience of the neighborhood supermarket with the expertise uh, and service of the specialist shop so this is what we give in our store reliance fresh signature stores and in terms of merchandise we give to our customers the uh, signature categories like fmv bakery and staples we also have a strong range in the uh, cuisines with limited focus in home and personal care strong range in uh, ethnic snacks uh, in terms of store environment uh, we have a friendly store staff best in class service uh like we have a new fixture changes and fresh visual design giving the premium look to the customers and in terms of the channel operations we give the uh, like uh, digital channel for ordering uh, and home delivery also we give through our stores so these are few snapshots of our store this is the food fruits and vegetable vegetable section this is international cuisine section this is shop and shop experience theater this is grain market and oil station this is a reliance fresh signature the second uh, section here is the uh, e-commerce player uh, so uh, the, the e-commerce player present in india are amazon pantry big basket and grofers so amazon Pat- pantry operates in 300 cities and it is launched in hyderabad in uh, september 2016 and it is an online supermarket for the grocery and household needs they deliver the products to the end customer the next day at a competitive price the second big e-com player in india is a big basket which operates in 30 city and it is one of the india's largest online food and grocery store and they offer same day delivery across the city and they also have a customer return uh, policy and the third player is the grofers which operates in uh, 32 cities uh, so during the lockdown uh, due to covid 19 the acceleration and acceptance of korean culture is increased in india people deep dived into the korean culture through k dramas k pop and that how k food demand suddenly increased in india especially the korean noodles but due to this high demand it is a great opportunity for korean food uh, spices condiment manufacturers to enter into india market the k food brands and food will be adopted by indian consumers well due to the similarity in taste and spi- uh, and spice used is same only concern is in india is a vegetarian dominant country so the export of non veg ingredients and non veg items will be less accepted the, co- the korean culture gained huge acceptance in uh, 2020 and is still growing in 2021 and so on the food uh, companies have huge market open of opportunity in, in india the influence of k food is so wide even mcdonalds has started a bts range in their in their stores uh, non Shin, the Korean noodle brand, is getting uh, popularity in India and has seen a growth of 130 percent in sales compared to 2019, which indicates the taste is accepted by consumers. Not only that, even Orient brand has set up a manufacturing unit in India to meet the demand. So, considering all these factors, we all look forward to have more and more Korean food brands in India, and we welcome you all. Thank you. 감사합니다, 미스터 아미네스트리 파트님. 다음은 인도의 최근 경제 상황과 코트라 식품 수출 지원 사업에 대해 코트라 모바일 무역관 민유지 차장님이 발표해 주시겠습니다. 안녕하세요, 코트라 모바일 무역관 민유지입니다. 마지막으로 인도 최근 경제 동향과 식품 시장 현황, 코트라 수출 지원 사업에 대해 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 먼저 인도 국가 개요입니다. 인도는 아시아 남부에 위치해 있고 면적은 우리나라의 33배 크기, 세계에서는 일곱 번째로 큰 나라입니다. 
인구는 13.9억 명으로 세계에서 두 번째로 많고 앞으로 5년 내에 세계 1위가 될 것이라는 전망이 우세합니다. 언어는 힌디어 영어가 가장 영향력 있는 언어이고 이 외에도 21개 언어가 공식 언어로 인정받고 있습니다. 참고로 해외 비즈니스를 하는 인도 기업인들은 대체로 영어를 잘 구사합니다. 인종은 북방의 인도 아리안인 남방의 드라비다족으로 크게 나뉘고 종교는 인구 80% 이상이 힌두교를 믿고 또 나머지는 이슬람, 기독교, 시크교, 불교 순입니다. 작년 기준으로 인도 1인당 GDP는 2,200달러입니다. 우리나라 1인당 GDP가 3만 5천 달러니까 약 16분의 1에 해당하는 수준입니다. 정치 체제는 의원 내각제를 채택하고 있어서 실질적인 국가 원수는 총리이고요. 현재 인도 인민당 소속의 나렌드라 모디 총리가 2014년부터 높은 지지율을 받으면서 안정적으로 임기를 수행하고 있습니다. 인도의 최근 경제 성장률을 보면 코로나로 2022년 마이너스 7% 역성장을 했지만 작년 2021년에는 다른 신흥국보다 높은 9% 플러스 성장을 하면서 코로나 이전 수준을 회복했습니다. 무역도 수입 수출 모두 큰 폭으로 성장을 해서 작년 한해 전체 규모 9,700억 달러를 기록했습니다. 올해 1분기 경우도 전년 동기 대비 수출 수입 모두 20%대의 증가율을 기록하고 있습니다. 인도 무역을 국가별로 살펴보면 미국, 중국, UAE, 사우디아라비아 순으로 교역량이 많고 우리나라는 인도 기준에서 보면 11번째 교역국입니다. 인도가 주로 수출하는 품목은 석유, 보석, 원자로, 철강, 유기화학물질 순서이고 주 수입 품목 역시 석유, 보석, 전자기기, 원자로, 유기화학물질 순서입니다. 정부가 강력한 제조업 진흥책을 추진하고 있어서 기계나 화학, 철강 같은 중간, 중간제 수입도 많이 하고 있습니다. 우리나라와 무역을 보면 인도는 우리나라 7대 수출 대상국이고 5대 흑자국입니다. 우리나라 5대 수출 품목은 합성수지, 반도체, 석유, 자동차 부품, 철강 제품 순이고 주로 수입하는 품목은 플라스틱 원료로 쓰이는 나프타, 알루미늄 괴 스크랩, 정밀 화학 원료, 합금철 등입니다. 참고로 우리나라와 인도는 2010년에 FTA와 유사한 세파 협정을 체결을 했고 이 협약은 인도가 OECD 국가와 맺은 최초의 협약이라는 그런 의미가 있습니다. 어, 세파 혜택에 대해서는 뒤에서 다시 다 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 인도의 투자 유치 동향을 보면 코로나에도 불구하고 2019년, 2020년 계속 많은 외국인 투자를 유치했습니다. 어, 조세 회피 지역을 빼면 미국, 일본, 영국, 독일 순으로 투자 금액이 크고 산업별로는 서비스업, 컴퓨터, 소프트웨어, 하드웨어 산업, 통신산업, 자동차 산업에 대한 투자가 많이 이루어지고 있습니다. 우리나라의 인도 투자는 작년까지 누적 금액이 73억 달러 수준으로 우리가 베트남이나 인도네시아, 브라질 등 다른 신흥국에 투자하는 금액과 비교하면 아직은 적은 규모입니다. 업종별로는 제조업 투자가 전체 80%를 차지하고 있어서 우리나라 인도 투자가 주로 제조업에 집중돼 있음을 알수 있고 기업 크기별로는 대기업 투자 비중이 크고 또 중소기업은 대체로 대기업과 동자, 어, 동반 진출했거나 대기업에 납품하는 경우가 많습니다. 참고로 우리 기업들은 뉴델리와 첸나이에 많은 숫자가 진출해 있고 그 다음으로 푸네, 문바이, 벵갈룰루 순으로 진출해 있습니다. 이쯤에서 올해 인도 경제 전망을 말씀드리면 현재 수출, 소비, 투자 같은 경제 지표가 다른 신흥국과 비교했을 때 양호하게 집계되고 있어서 작년과 비슷한 수준의 성장률을 올해도 달성할 것으로 전망됩니다. IMF나 월드뱅크 같은 전문기관들도 대체로 8%에서 10% 사이 높은 경제성장률을 예상하고 있습니다. 코로나 관련해서도 전체 인구 60% 이상이 백신 접종을 2차까지 완료했기 때문에 3차 웨이브가 오더라도 경제에 미치는 타격은 예전보다 제한적일 것이라는 견해가 많습니다.
이와 더불어서 중국과 인도 간에 최근 국경 분쟁 이슈가 크게 발생했는데 정부 차원에서 중국산 수입 규제를 강화하고 있고 또 인도 소비자들도 반중 정서가 심화되고 있어서 우리 소비재나 산업재가 반사 이익을 누릴 수 있을 것으로 기대가 됩니다. 네, 이제 식품 시장에 대해서 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 인도의 식품 시장은 세계에서 세 번째로 큰 시장이고 2027년까지 매년 8% 이상의 고성장을 할 것으로 기대가 됩니다. 식품 시장은 인도 소비 시장의 가장 큰 비중을 차지하고 있고 식품 시장 내에서는 가공 식품이 차지하는 비중과 성장률이 제일 높습니다. 정부도 식품 가공업에 대한 투자를 장려하기 위해서 PLI라는 생산 연계 인센티브 제도를 통해 2027년까지 총 15억 달러를 지원하겠다고 최근에 발표한 바 있습니다. 인도 식품 가공업 비중을 지역별로 보면 문바이가 속해 있는 마라슈트라주가 전체 20% 수준으로 가장 많고 그 뒤를 타밀나두, 카르나타카, 무타프라데시, 구자라트주가 잇고 있습니다. 식품 수입 시장의 경우 가공식품 기준으로 작년 137억 달러를 수입했습니다. 전체 산업 규모와 비교할 때 앞으로 성장 여지가 많다고 볼수 있겠습니다. 최대 식품 수입국은 인도네시아, 아르헨티나, 말레이시아, 우크라이나이고 우리나라 경우 작년 수입 규모는 1,100만 달러, 37번째 수입국이었습니다. 아직은 좀 매우 작은 규모지만 연도별 성장률은 증가하는 추세입니다. 품목별로 보면 역시 우리나라 라면 수입이 제일 많고 알코올이 들어가지 않은 음료수, 또 고추장, 된장 같은 소스 제품 순으로 수입을 많이 하고 있습니다. 그렇다면 최근 인도 식품 소비 트렌드는 어떤지 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 첫째, 건강과 성분에 대한 관심이 높아졌습니다. 인도 사람들은 예전에도 건강을 매우 중시하는 국민이긴 했지만 특히 코로나를 겪으면서 면역에 도움이 되는 것, 오가닉한 제품, 슈퍼푸드, 자연식 등을 더욱 선호하고 있습니다. 우리나라 김치도 건강한 음식이라고 알려지면서 최근 인도인들 사이에 인기가 높아지고 있고 또 인도 식품 기업이 직접 김치를 만들어 판매하고 있기도 합니다. 둘째, 간편식, 반조리, 인스턴트 수요가 증가하고 있습니다. 이런 현상은 대체로 세계적인 추세인데 인도 역시도 도시화가 계속 진행되고 젊은 층이 많아지면서 점점 이런 조리된 식품에 대한 소비가 늘고 있습니다. 참고로 현재 인도 도시화율은 35%이고 2030년에는 40%가 될 전망이며 이때 인도의 도시 인구는 약 6억 명이 될 것으로 예상됩니다. 셋째, 식품을 온라인에서 구매하는 비율이 높아지고 있습니다. 역시 코로나 기간 동안 두드러진 현상인데 최근 아마존, 빅바스켓, 그로퍼 같은 식품 전문 온라인 기업이 급성장하고 또 온라인 식품 구매도 80% 이상 증가한 것으로 조사됐습니다. 다음, 육류에 대한 인식이 바뀌고 있습니다. 인도는 채식국가라고 많이 알고 계시는데 실제 순수 채식 인구 비중은 현재 30에서 35% 사이로 많이 감소했습니다. 그리고 육류 소비는 주로 대도시를 중심으로 증가하고 있습니다. 다섯 번째, 외국 음식에 대해 예전보다 개방적입니다. 올리브 오일이나 브로콜리, 적상추, 주치니, 아보카도 같은 외국 식자재를 적극적으로 섭취하기 시작했고 을 실제로 정부 조사 결과에 따르면 인도 전통 식자재 국내 생산 규모는 작년에 9에서 12% 증가한 데 반해서 외국 식자재 국내 생산량은 품목에 따라 14에서 16% 증가했다고 합니다. 인도 사람들의 입맛이 점차 세계화되고 있다고 볼수 있겠습니다. 그럼 우리나라 식품의 인도 시장 진출 여건은 어떤지 살펴보겠습니다. 일단 한국에 대한 관심이 높습니다. 해외문화원에서 매년 우리나라 국가의 이미지를 조사하는데 이 조사 결과를 보면 인도가 우리나라를 매우 긍정적으로 인식하고 있음을 알수 있습니다. 16개국 대상으로 조사한 19년도 보고서를 보면 인도가 한국 호감도가 가장 높은 국가였고 또 한국 관심도도 두 번째로 높은 국가였습니다. 작년에는 조사 대상국을 늘려서 24개 국가를 조사했는데 여전히 인도의 한국 호감도와 관심도는 높은 순위를 기록했습니다. 
이런 호감도는 K-POP이나 K-드라마 인기 영향도 있고 또 우리나라 대기업인 삼성전자, LG전자, 현대차 등이 인도에 일찍부터 진출해서 자동차, 휴대폰, 가전기기 분야에서 좋은 성과를 내고 있는 것도 큰 영향이 있는 것으로 분석됩니다. 작년에 유로모니터 보고서에 따르면 인도 넷플릭스에 등록된 한국 컨텐츠 시청률이 약 4배 이상 증가를 했고 또 한국 라면 구매도 160% 증가한 것으로 나타났습니다. 현재 인도 전역에 한식당 30개가 운영 중이라고 하고요. 또 고객의 70%는 현재 있는 것으로 조사가 됐습니다. 같은 조사에서 설문조사에 참여한 인도인의 88%가 한국 음식을 먹어보고 싶다고 답을 했고 그 중에 한국 음식을 한 번도 먹어본 적이 없다고 답한 응답자는 40%에 불과했습니다. 한국 식품 수요가 매우 높다는 것을 충분히 확인할 수 있습니다. 두 번째로 온라인과 현대식 유통망이 발달하고 있는 점도 우리 기업이 진출하는 데 긍정적입니다. 최근 인도 전체 온라인 결제 대금이 225억 달러로 전 세계 1위를 기록했습니다. 전자상거래 시장도 작년 한해 동안 25% 성장을 했고 반면에 전통 소매점들의 매출 비중은 2019년 88%에서 2021년도 75%로 크게 감소했습니다. 그동안 인도 유통시장은 키라니아라는 전통 소매점 비중이 높아서 특히 우리 같은 해외 기업의 시장 진입 장벽이 높았는데 앞으로는 슈퍼마켓이나 마트 같은 현대식 유통망 비중이 커지면서 우리 기업 진출도 더 용이, 용이해질 것으로 기대됩니다. 마지막으로 우리나라와 인도 간 체결된 세파가 우리 식품 수출에 도움이 될 것으로 기대됩니다. 한인도 세파는 2010년 체결돼서 2020년부터 관세 감면 혜택을 본격적으로 받기 시작했는데요. 특히 식품 분야는 인도 관세가 최대 150%까지 매우 높은 분야라서 세파를 적용하면 우리가 수출하는 품목 대다수가 5% 수준까지 관세가 인하됩니다. 가령 라면이나 고추장은 세파가 적용되면 기존 관세 30%가 5%로 낮아집니다. 인스턴트 커피 경우는 다소 민감한 품목으로 분류돼서 기존 세율의 30% 절반인 15%가 적용됩니다. 반면에 과일이나 알코올 음료처럼 보호 품목으로 분류돼서 세파 혜택 받지 못하는 식품도 일부 있으니 참고해 주시기 바랍니다. 그리고 한 가지 덧붙이면 국산 재료로 제조한 고추장은 5%까지 관세를 낮출 수 있지만 고춧가루를 중국산으로 하는 고추장이 많은데요. 이런 경우는 세파 혜택을 받지 못하고 기존 세율 30%가 그대로 적용이 된다는 점은 기억해 주시기 바랍니다. 인도는 가격에 매우 민감한 시작입니다. 따라서 이런 관세 효과는 우리 기업들이 바이어와 협상을 할때 분명 큰 도움이 될 것으로 예상됩니다. 마지막으로 인도 식품 시장 진출을 위한 코트라 지원 사업에 대해 말씀드리겠습니다. 코트라 케이푸드 인도 진출 지원 사업은 스와드 코리아라는 영문 명칭도 있는데요. 참고로 스와드는 힌디어로 맛, 영어로 테이스트라는 뜻입니다. 저희 지원 사업은 우리 기업의 시장 초기 진입부터 시장 포지셔닝, 시장 확대 전 과정을 지원해 드립니다. 일단 초기 진입 단계에서는 수출과 관련된 기초 정보를 제공을 해 드리고 그 다음 단계에서는 현지 관심 바이어를 발굴하여 1대1 상담을 주선해 드립니다. 상담 주선 후에도 후속 상담, 계약 체결, 물류 통관 등 과정을 맞춤형으로 밀착 지원해 드립니다. 마지막으로 수출한 제품이 현지에, 어, 현지에서 잘 팔릴 수 있도록 대규모 한식 프로모션 사업을 추진해서 우리 식품 판매와 홍보도 지원하고 있습니다. 저희 스와드 코리아 식품 지원 사업은 올해 2년 차 사업이고 작년에 처음 시작했습니다. 작년 성과를 간략히 말씀드리면 우리 식품 기업 총 103개사가 참여했고 해외 바이어는 25개사가 참여했습니다. 저희가 추진한 사업 내용은 온라인 상담에 온오프라인 K푸드 판촉전, K푸드 SNS 마케팅, 인도 식품시장 조사 사업 등을 추진했습니다. K푸드 판촉전은 네이처스 바스켓이라는 인도 프리미어 식품 체인하고 공동으로 개최했고 한식 홍보 활동은 한식진흥원과 연계해서 추진했습니다. 주요 성과로는 어, 무역관을 통해서 우리 기업과 바이어가 150회 이상 매칭이 됐고 참가기업 14개사가 수출이 성사됐습니다.
그 중에 11개 사는 제품이 인도 대형 유통망에 입점했습니다. 고추장과 된장, 김, 김치 시즈닝 같은 제품들이 유통망에 새로 입점했습니다. 그리고 문바이나 뉴델리 등 전국 20개 네이처스 바스켓 매장에서 2주 동안 케이푸드 판촉 행사를 개최했고 이때 한식품 매출이 60% 이상 증가하는 좋은 성과를 거두었습니다. 사진은 작년 행사 사진들입니다. 인도 식품 매장에 우리 한식품 전용 매대가 설치된 모습, 또 스크린에서 우리나라 음식 홍보 영상이 상영되는 모습, 그리고 온라인몰에서 우리 중소기업이 수출한 된장, 고추장이 판매되고 있는 모습입니다. 저희가 인도 셰프를 초빙해서 요리 시연에도 개최를 했고, 또 인도 한식당을 방문해서 현지인들 대상으로 한식 인터뷰도 진행을 했습니다. 그 외에도 자체적으로 인도 사람을 타겟으로 한 한식 홍보 영상을 여러 개 만들어서 유튜브에 게재했습니다. 올해도 오늘 설명회를 시작으로 내일부터 3일간 집중 수출 상담회가 개최될 예정이고요. 이 기간 후에도 상시적으로 바이어 매칭과 우리 기업 수출 컨설팅을 계속할 예정입니다. 참고로 올해 케이푸드 판족전은 인도의 최대 소비 시즌이라고 할수 있는 10월 디왈리 무렵에 개최할 예정이니 많은 관심 부탁드리겠습니다. 저희 코트라는 여러분의 성공적인 인도 시장 진출을 위해 노력을 아끼지 않겠습니다. 이상 제 발표를 마치겠습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. 차장님. 이상으로 오늘 인도 식품시장 진출 설명회 발표를 모두 마무리했습니다. 오늘 말씀드린 내용과 관련하여 문의사항이 있으신 경우는 저희 문바의 외학관으로 언제든 연락주시기 바랍니다. 긴 시간 함께해 주셔서 감사합니다.